Chapter Seven of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Seven: The Second Inaugural. We have seen what effect the Hampton Roads Conference produced upon Jefferson Davis, and to what intemperate and wrathful utterance it provoked him. Its effect upon President Lincoln was almost directly the reverse. His interview with the rebel commissioners doubtless strengthened his former convictions that the rebellion was waning in enthusiasm and resources, and that the Union cause must triumph at no distant day. Secure in his renewal of four years' personal leadership, and hopefully inspirited by every sign of early victory in the war, his only thought was to shorten, by generous conciliation, the period of the dreadful conflict. His temper was not one of exultation, but of broad, patriotic charity, and of keen, sensitive personal sympathy for the whole country and all its people, south as well as north. His conversation with Stevens, Hunter, and Campbell had probably revealed to him glimpses of the undercurrent of their anxiety that fraternal bloodshed and the destructive ravages of war might somehow come to an end. To every word or tone freighted with this feeling, the magnanimous and tender heart of President Lincoln sincerely responded. As a ruler and a statesman, he was clear in his judgment and inflexible in his will to re-establish Union and maintain freedom for all who had gained it by the chances of war. But also as a statesman and a ruler, he was ready to lend his individual influence and his official discretion to any measure of mitigation and manifestation of goodwill that, without imperiling the Union of the States or the liberty of the citizen, might promote acquiescence in impending political changes an abatement and reconciliation of hostile sectional feelings. Filled with such thoughts and purposes, he spent the day after his return from Hampton Roads in considering and perfecting a new proposal, designed as a peace offering to the states in rebellion. On the evening of February 5, 1865, he called his cabinet together and read to them the following draft of a message and proclamation, which he had written during the day, and upon which he invited their opinion and advice. Quote, Fellow citizens of the Senate and House of Representatives, I respectfully recommend that a joint resolution, substantially as follows, be adopted, so soon as practicable, by your honorable bodies. Resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that the President of the United States is hereby empowered, in his discretion, to pay four hundred millions of dollars to the states of Alabama, Arkansas, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, Missouri, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and West Virginia, in the manner and on the conditions following to it, the payment to be made in six per cent government bonds, and to be distributed among said states pro rata on their respective slave populations, as shown by the census of 1860, and no part of said sum to be paid unless all resistance to the national authority shall be abandoned and cease on or before the first day of April next, and upon such abandonment and ceasing of resistance, one half of the said sum to be paid in manner aforesaid, and the remaining half to be paid only upon the amendment of the national constitution recently proposed by Congress becoming valid law, on or before the first day of July next, by the action thereon of the requisite number of states. The adoption of such resolution is sought with a view to embody it, with other propositions, in a proclamation looking to peace and reunion. Whereas a joint resolution has been adopted by Congress in the following words to wit, now, therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, do proclaim, declare, and make known that on the conditions therein stated, the power conferred on the executive in and by said joint resolution will be fully exercised, that war will cease, and armies be reduced to a basis of peace, that all political offenses will be pardoned, that all property except slaves liable to confiscation or forfeiture will be released therefrom, except in cases of intervening interests of third parties, and that liberality will be recommended to Congress upon all points not lying within executive control. End quote. 
it may be said with truth that this was going to the extreme of magnanimity toward a foe already in the throes and helplessness of overwhelming defeat a foe that had rebelled without adequate cause and was maintaining the contest without reasonable hope but mr lincoln remembered that the rebels notwithstanding all their offences and errors were yet american citizens members of the same nation brothers of the same blood he remembered too that the object of the war equally with peace and freedom was the maintenance of one government and the perpetuation of one union not only must hostilities cease but dissension suspicion and estrangement be eradicated as it had been in the past so it must again become in the future not merely a nation with the same constitution and laws but a people united in feeling in hope in aspiration in his judgment the liberality that would work reconciliation would be well employed whether their complaints for the past were well or ill-founded he would remove even the temptation to complain in the future he would give them peace reunion political pardon remission of confiscation wherever it was in his power and securing unquestioned and universal freedom through the constitutional amendment he would at the same time compensate their loss of slavery by a direct money equivalent it turned out that he was more humane and liberal than his constitutional advisers the endorsement of his own handwriting on the manuscript draft of his proposed message records the result of his appeal and suggestion Quote, february fifth eighteen sixty five today these papers which explain themselves were drawn up and submitted to the cabinet and unanimously disapproved by them a lincoln end quote. it would appear that there was but little discussion of the proposition the president's evident earnestness on the one side and the unanimous dissent of the cabinet on the other probably created an awkward situation which could be best relieved by silence on each hand the diary of secretary wells gives only a brief mention of the important incident but it reflects the feeling which pervaded the cabinet chamber Quote, monday february sixth eighteen sixty five there was a cabinet meeting last evening the president had matured a scheme which he hoped would be successful in promoting peace it was a proposition for paying the expense of the war for two hundred days or four hundred millions to the rebel states to be for the extinguishment of slavery or for such purpose as the states were disposed this in few words was the scheme it did not meet with favor but was dropped the earnest desire of the president to conciliate and effect peace was manifest but there may be such a thing as so overdoing as to cause a distrust or adverse feeling in the present temper of congress the proposed measure if a wise one could not be carried through successfully i do not think the scheme would accomplish any good results the rebels would misconstrue it if the offer were made if attempted and defeated it would do harm End quote. the statement of secretary usher written many years afterward from memory also records the deep feeling with which the president received the non-concurrence of his executive council quote, the members of the cabinet were all opposed he seemed somewhat surprised at that and asked how long will the war last no one answered but he soon said a hundred days we are spending now in carrying on the war three millions a day which will amount to all this money besides all the lives with a deep sigh he added but you are all opposed to me and i will not send the message End quote. the entry made by secretary wells in his diary on the morning after the cabinet meeting as to the amount and time is undoubtedly the correct one coinciding as it does with the president's manuscript but the discrepancy in the figures of the two witnesses is of little moment both accounts show us that the proposal was not based on sentiment alone but upon a practical arithmetical calculation an expenditure of three or four hundred millions was inevitable but his plan would save many precious lives would shield homes and hearths from further sorrow and desolation would dissolve sectional hatred and plant fraternal goodwill though overborne in opinion clearly he was not convinced with the words you are all opposed to me sadly uttered mr lincoln folded up the paper and ceased the discussion of what was doubtless the project then nearest his heart we may surmise however that as he wrote upon it the endorsement we have quoted and laid away he looked forward to a not distant day when in the new term of the presidency to which he was already elected 
the cabinet would respond more charitably to his own generous impulses. Few cabinet secrets were better kept than this proposal of the president in its discussion. Since the subject was indefinitely postponed, it was, of course, desirable that it should not come to the knowledge of the public. Silence was rendered easier by the fact that popular attention in the North busied itself with rumors concerning the Hampton Roads Conference. To satisfy this curiosity, a resolution of the House of Representatives, passed on February 8th, requested the President to communicate such information respecting it as he might deem not incompatible with the public interest. With this request, Mr. Lincoln complied on the 10th, by a message containing all the correspondence, followed by a brief report touching the points of conference. Quote, on the morning of the 3rd, the three gentlemen, Messrs. Stevens, Hunter, and Campbell, came aboard of our steamer, and had an interview with the Secretary of State and myself of several hours' duration. No question of preliminaries to the meeting was then and there made or mentioned. No other person was present, no papers were exchanged or produced, and it was, in advance, agreed that the conversation was to be informal and verbal merely. On our part, the whole substance of the instructions to the Secretary of State, herein before recited, was stated and insisted upon, and nothing was said inconsistent therewith, while by the other party it was not said that in any event, or on any condition, they would ever consent to reunion, and yet they equally omitted to declare that they never would so consent. They seemed to desire a postponement of that question, and the adoption of some other course first, which, as some of them seemed to argue, might or might not lead to reunion, but which course, we thought, would amount to an indefinite postponement. The conference ended without results. End quote. A short discussion occurred in the House on the motion to print this message, but it did not rise above the level of an ordinary party wrangle. The few Democrats who took part in it complained of the President for refusing an armistice, while the Republicans retorted with Jefferson Davis's conditions about the two countries and the more recent declarations of his Richmond harangue, announcing his readiness to perish for independence. On the whole, both Congress and the country were gratified that the incident had called out Mr. Lincoln's renewed declaration of an unalterable resolve to maintain the Union. Patriotic hope was quickened, and public confidence strengthened by noting once more his singleness of purpose and steadfastness of faith. No act of his could have formed a more fitting prelude to his second inauguration, which was now rapidly approaching, and the preliminary steps of which were at this time being consummated. A new phase in the Reconstruction question was developed in the usual congressional routine of counting the electoral votes of the late presidential election. Former chapters have set forth the President's general views on Reconstruction, and shown that, though the executive and legislative branches of the government differed as to the theory and policy of restoring insurrectionary states to their normal federal functions, such difference had not reached the point of troublesome or dangerous antagonism. Over the new question, also, dissension and conflict were happily avoided. By instruction to his military commanders, and in private letters to prominent citizens, Mr. Lincoln had strongly advised and actively promoted the formation of loyal state governments in Louisiana, Tennessee, and Arkansas, and had maintained the restored government of Virginia after the division of that state and the admission of West Virginia into the Union, and had officially given them the recognition of the executive department of the government. The legislative department, however, had latterly withheld its recognition and refused them representation in Congress. The query now arose whether the popular and electoral votes of some of those states for president should be allowed and counted. The subject was taken up by the House, which, on January 30th, passed a joint resolution naming the insurrectionary states, declaring them to have been in armed rebellion on the 8th of November, 1864, and not entitled to representation in the Electoral College. A searching debate on this resolution arose in the Senate, which called out the best legal talent of that body. It could not very consistently be affirmed that Louisiana, Tennessee, and Arkansas, held by federal troops and controlled by federal commanders, in part at least, were in armed rebellion on Election Day under whatever constitutional theory of Reconstruction. The phraseology was finally amended to read that the rebel states, quote, were in such condition on the 8th day of November, 1864, 
that no valid election for electors of president and vice president of the united states according to the constitution and laws thereof was held therein on said day end quote. and by this form the joint resolution was passed by both houses joint resolutions of congress have all the force and effect of laws and custom requires the president to approve them in the same manner as regular acts his signature in this case might therefore be alleged to imply that he consented to or adopted a theory of reconstruction at variance with his former recommendation and action to avoid the possibility of such misconstruction mr lincoln sent congress a short message in which he said quote, the joint resolution entitled joint resolution declaring certain states not entitled to representation in the electoral college has been signed by the executive in deference to the view of congress implied in its passage and presentation to him in his own view however the two houses of congress convened under the twelfth article of the constitution have complete power to exclude from counting all electoral votes deemed by them to be illegal and it is not competent for the executive to defeat or obstruct that power by a veto as would be the case if his action were at all essential in the matter he disclaims all right of the executive to interfere in any way in the matter of canvassing or counting electoral votes and he also disclaims that by signing said resolution he has expressed any opinion on the recitals of the preamble or any judgment of his own upon the subject of the resolution End quote in anticipation of possible debate and contention on the subject of counting the electoral votes of reconstructed states congress had on february sixth adopted what afterwards became famous as the twenty-second joint rule which directed in substance that all such questions should be decided not by the joint convention of the two houses but by each house for itself without debate the two houses having temporarily separated for that purpose and requiring the concurrence of both for any affirmative action or to count a vote objected to when the two houses met in joint convention on the eighth day of february mention was made by the vice president presiding that quote, the chair has in his possession returns from the states of louisiana and tennessee but in obedience to the law of the land the chair holds it to be his duty not to present them to the convention end quote no member insisted on having these returns open since they could not possibly change the result only the returns therefore from the loyal states including west virginia were counted showing two hundred and twelve electoral votes for lincoln and twenty-one for mcclellan the vice president thereupon announced quote, that abraham lincoln of the state of illinois having received a majority of the whole number of electoral votes is duly elected president of the united states for four years commencing on the fourth day of march eighteen sixty five the usual committee was appointed to wait upon mr lincoln and notify him of his second election and in response to their announcement he read the following brief address quote, with deep gratitude to my countrymen for this mark of their confidence with a distrust of my own ability to perform the duty required under the most favorable circumstances and now rendered doubly difficult by existing national perils yet with a firm reliance on the strength of our free government and the eventual loyalty of the people to the just principles upon which it was founded and above all with an unshaken faith in the supreme ruler of nations i accept this trust be pleased to signify this to the respective houses of congress End quote in the informal friendly conversation which followed the president said to the committee in substance quote, having served four years in the depths of a great and yet unended national peril i can view this call to a second term in no wise more flattering to myself than as an expression of the public judgment that i may better finish a difficult work in which i have labored from the first than could any one less severely schooled to the task End quote. The formal inauguration of Mr. Lincoln for his second presidential term took place at the appointed time, March 4th, 1865. There is little variation in the simple but impressive pageantry with which this official ceremony is celebrated. The principal novelty commented upon by the newspapers was the share which the hitherto enslaved race had for the first time in this public and political drama. Civic associations of Negro citizens joined in the procession and a battalion of negro soldiers formed part of the military escort 
the weather was sufficiently favorable to allow the ceremonies to take place on the eastern portico in view of a vast throng of spectators imaginative beholders who were prone to draw augury and comfort from symbols could rejoice that the great bronze statue of freedom now crowned the dome of the capitol and that her guardianship was justified by the fact that the thirteenth amendment virtually blotted slavery from the constitution the central act of the occasion was president lincoln's second inaugural address which enriched the political literature of the union with another masterpiece and which deserves to be quoted in full he said quote, fellow countrymen at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first then a statement somewhat in detail of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper now at the expiration of four years during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation little that is new could be presented the progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this, four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war all dreaded it all sought to avert it while the inaugural address was being delivered from this place devoted altogether to saving the union without war insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war seeking to dissolve the union and divide effects by negotiation both parties deprecated war but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest all knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war to strengthen perpetuate and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the union even by war while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding both read the same bible and pray to the same god and each invokes his aid against the other it may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just god's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces but let us judge not that we be not judged the prayers of both could not be answered that of neither has been answered fully the almighty has his own purposes woe unto the world because of offences for it must needs be that offences come, but woe to that man by whom the offence cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offences, which in the providence of God must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offence came shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living god always ascribe to him fondly do we hope fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away yet if god wills that it continue 
until all the wealth piled by the bondman's two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said three thousand years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. End quote. The address being concluded, Chief Justice Chase administered the oath of office, and listeners who heard Abraham Lincoln for the second time repeat, quote, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, end quote, went from the impressive scene to their several homes with thankfulness and with confidence that the destiny of the country and the liberty of the citizen were in safe keeping. The fiery trial through which he had hitherto walked showed him possessed of the capacity, the courage, and the will to keep the promise of his oath. Among the many criticisms passed by writers and thinkers upon the language of the second inaugural, none will so interest the reader as that of Mr. Lincoln himself, written about ten days after its delivery in the following letter to a friend. Quote, Dear Mr. Weed, everyone likes a compliment. Thank you for yours on my little notification speech and on the recent inaugural address. I expect the latter to wear as well as, perhaps better than, anything I have produced, but I believe it is not immediately popular. Men are not flattered by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. To deny it, however, in this case, is to deny that there is a God governing the world. It is a truth which I thought needed to be told, and, as whatever of humiliation there is in it falls most directly on myself, I thought others might afford for me to tell it. End quote. A careful student of Mr. Lincoln's character will also find this inaugural address instinct with another meaning, which, very naturally, the President's own comment did not touch. The eternal law of compensation, which it declares and applies to the sin and fall of American slavery, in a diction rivaling the fire and dignity of the old Hebrew prophecies, may, without violent inference, be interpreted to foreshadow an intention to renew, at a fitting moment, the brotherly goodwill gift to the South, which has been treated of in the first part of this chapter. Such an inference finds strong corroboration in the phrases which closed the last public address he ever made, and which we have elsewhere quoted in full. On Tuesday evening, April 11th, a considerable assemblage of citizens of Washington gathered at the executive mansion to celebrate the victory of Grant over Lee. The rather long and careful speech which Mr. Lincoln made on that occasion was, however, less about the past than about the future. It discussed the subject of Reconstruction, as illustrated in the case of Louisiana, showing also how that issue was related to the questions of emancipation, the condition of the freedmen, the welfare of the South, and the ratification of the Constitutional Amendment. Quote, so new and unprecedented is the whole case, he concluded, that no exclusive and inflexible plan can safely be prescribed as to details and collaterals. Such exclusive and inflexible plan would surely become a new entanglement. Important principles may and must be inflexible. In the present situation, as the phrase goes, it may be my duty to make some new announcement to the people of the South. I am considering, and shall not fail to act when satisfied, that action will be proper. Can anyone doubt 
that this new announcement which was taking shape in his mind would again have embraced and combined justice to the blacks and generosity to the whites of the south with union and liberty for the whole country end of chapter seven recording by owen cook in potawatomi ceded land chapter eight of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by marianne spiegel abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter eight five forks from the hour of mr lincoln's re-election the confederate cause was doomed the cheering of the troops which greeted the news from the north was heard within the lines at richmond and at petersburg and although the leaders maintained to the end their attitude of defiance the impression rapidly gained ground among the people that the end was not far off the stimulus of hope being gone they began to feel the pinch of increasing want their currency had become almost worthless in October, a dollar in gold was worth thirty-five dollars in Confederate money. A month later, it brought fifty dollars. With the opening of the new year, the price rose to sixty dollars, and soon after to seventy. And despite the efforts of the Confederate Treasury, which would occasionally rush into the market and beat down the price of gold ten or twenty per cent in a day, the currency gradually depreciated until a hundred for one was offered and not taken. As a result of this vanishing value of their money, a pretentious rise took place in the prices of all the necessaries of life. It is hard for a people to recognize that their money is good for nothing. To do this is to confess that their government has failed. It was natural, therefore, for the unhappy citizens of Richmond to think that monstrous prices were being extorted for food, clothing, and fuel, when in fact they were paying no more than was reasonable. The journals and diaries of the time are filled with bitter execrations against the extortioners and forestallers. But when we translate their prices into the gold standard, we wonder how the grocers and clothiers lived. To pay a thousand dollars for a barrel of flour was enough to strike a householder with horror, but ten dollars is not a famine price. A suit of clothes costs from one thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. But if you divide this sum by seventy-five, there is very little profit left for the tailor. High prices, however, even if paid in dry leaves, are hardship when dry leaves are not plentiful. And there was scarcity, even of Confederate money, in the South. In Richmond, which lived upon the war, the dearth was especially evident. The clerks in the departments received, say, four thousand dollars a year, hardly enough for a month's provisions skilled mechanics fared somewhat better they could earn so long as they kept out of the army something like six thousand dollars a year statesmanship was cheap a congressman's pay was five thousand five hundred dollars but most of the civil officers of the government managed to get their supplies at cost prices from the military stores it was illegal but they could not have lived otherwise and they doubtless considered their lives necessary to their country the depreciation of the confederate currency was an unmistakable symptom of a lack of confidence in the course of affairs since it did not arise from inflation on the contrary george a trenholm the secretary of the treasury did all he could to check this dangerous tendency going so far as to incur the reproaches of many who imagined his action enhanced prices all dealers instinctively felt the money was worthless and their only object was to get it out of their hands as soon as possible at whatever prices, in exchange for objects of real value. One Confederate diarist records with indignation that he saw a Jew buy at auction an old set of tablespoons for $575, and makes this a cause of complaint against the government, which permits men to acquire in this way the means of running away. Anybody who was able to leave the country became the object of the envy and hatred of those who remained behind. They began to treat their own financial system with contempt. When the officer in charge of the Treasury Note Bureau at Columbia, alarmed at the approach of Sherman, asked where he was to go, he could get no attention to his inquiries, one high functionary advising that he go to the devil. At every advance of General Grant's lines, a new disturbance and alarm was manifested in Richmond, the first proof of which was always a fresh rigor in the enforcement, not only of existing conscription laws, 
but of the arbitrary orders of the frightened authorities. After the capture of Fort Harrison, on the north side of the James, squads of guards were sent into the streets with directions to arrest every able-bodied man they met. They paid no regard to passes or to certificates of exemption or detail, but hurried the unhappy citizens off to the field, or herded them, pending their assignment to companies, within the railings of the public square. Two members of the cabinet, John H. Reagan and George Davis, were thus arrested on the streets by the zealous guards in spite of their protestations, though they were, of course, soon recognized and released. The pavements were swept of every class of loiterers. The clerks in the departments with their exemptions in their pockets were carried off, whether able to do duty or not. It is said by one Confederate writer that the medical boards were ordered to exempt no one who seemed capable of bearing arms for ten days, and he mentions an instance where a man died on the eleventh day of his service of consumption. Human nature will not endure such a strain as this. A week after the sweeping of Richmond for recruits, General William M. Gardner reported that more than half of the men thus dragged to the trenches had deserted. Of those who remained, the members of influential families came one by one back to the town on various pretexts, increasing the bitterness of feeling among those too poor or too obscure to rescue their sons and brothers. Desertion grew too common to punish. Almost every man in the Confederacy was, by statute or decree, liable to military service, and yet hundreds of thousands of them were not in the army. If men were to be shot for deserting, it would have been a question whether there were soldiers enough to shoot them. Mr. Davis acted prudently in remitting the death sentences laid before him, although this occasioned great dissatisfaction in the army. Near the end of the year, 1864, Longstreet reported 100 men of Pickett's division as in the guardhouse for desertion, attributing the blame for it to the numerous reprieves which had been granted, no one having been executed for two months. General Lee sent this report to Richmond with his approval, which gave great offense to the Confederate president. He returned the paper with an endorsement to the effect that the remission of sentences was not a proper subject for the criticism of a military commander. As disaster increased, each day brought its catastrophe. The Confederate government steadily lost ground in the confidence and respect of the Southern people. It is characteristic of every failing revolt that in the hour of ruin the participators turn upon one another with reproaches, often as causeless and unjust as those they cast upon their legitimate government. Mr. Davis and his counselors now underwent this natural retribution. They were doing their best, but they no longer got any credit for it. From every part of the Confederacy came complaints of what was done, demands for what was impossible to do. Some of the states were in a condition near to counter-revolution. Governor Brown of Georgia made no pretense of concealing his contumacy. The march of Sherman across his state seemed to have emancipated him from any feeling of obligation to the Confederacy. His letters to Richmond from that moment lost all color of allegiance. The feeling of North Carolina was little better. A slow paralysis was benumbing the limbs of the insurrection and even at the heart its vitality was plainly declining. The Confederate Congress, which had hitherto been the mere register of the President's will, now turned upon him and gave him wormwood to drink. On the 19th of January, they passed a resolution making Lee General-in-Chief of the Army. This Mr. Davis might have borne with patience, although it was intended as a notification to him that his meddling with military affairs must come to an end. But far worse was the necessity put upon him, as a sequel to this act, and in conformity with the resolution of Congress and of the Virginia legislature, of reappointing General Joseph E. Johnston to the command of the army which was to resist Sherman's victorious march to the north. After this he might say that the bitterness of death was past. The Virginia delegation in Congress passed a vote of want of confidence in the government's conduct of the war. Mr. Seddon, considering his honor impugned, and not being unwilling to lay down a thankless task, resigned his post of Secretary of War. Mr. Davis at first wished him to reconsider his action, claiming that such a declaration from congressmen was beyond their functions and subversive of the President's constitutional jurisdiction. But Mr. Seddon insisted, and General John B. Breckinridge was appointed in his place in February for the few weeks that remained before the final crash. Warnings of serious demoralization came daily from the Army. Even that firm support to the revolt seemed crumbling. Disaffection was so rife in official circles in Richmond that it was not thought politic to call public attention to it by repression. A detective reported a member of Congress as uttering treasonable language 
and for his pains was told at the War Department that matters of that sort were none of his business. It is a curious and instructive thing to note how the act of emancipation had by this time virtually enforced itself in Richmond. The value of slave property was gone. It is true that a slave was still occasionally sold, at a price less than one-tenth of what he would have brought before the war. But servants could be hired of their nominal owners at a barleycorn rate. Six dollars in gold would pay the hire of a good cook for a year, merely enough to keep up the show of vassalage. In effect, anyone could hire a negro for his keeping, which was all that anybody in Richmond got for his work. Even Mr. Davis had at last become docile to the stern teachings of events. In his message of November, he had recommended the employment of 40,000 slaves in the army, not as soldiers, it is true, save in the last extremity, with emancipation to come later. The determined buoyancy and fanfaronade of the rebel Department of State had finally given way. On the 27th of December, Mr. Benjamin wrote his last important instruction to John Slittle. It is nothing less than a cry of despair. He recounts the courage and fortitude with which the South has withstood for four years the attack of an arrogant and domineering race, vengeful, grasping, and ambitious. The very adjectives show a vast change from the Southern tone of former years. He complains bitterly of the attitude of foreign nations while the South is fighting the battles of England and France against the North. He asks with agonized earnestness, what it is they want. Are they determined never to recognize the Southern Confederacy until the United States assent to such action on their part? Do they propose under any circumstances to give other and more direct aid to the Northern people in attempting to enforce our submission to a hateful union? If so, it is but just that we be apprised of their purposes, to the end that we may then deliberately consider the terms, if any, upon which we can secure peace from the foes to whom the question is thus surrendered, and who have the countenance and encouragement of all mankind in the invasion of our country, the destruction of our homes, the extermination of our people. If, on the other hand, he continues, there be any conditions under which England and France would be willing to grant recognition, a frank exposition of such conditions is due to humanity. It is due now for it may enable us to save many lives most precious to our country by consenting to such terms in advance of another year's campaign. With this alternative, with the frantic offer to submit to any terms which Europe may impose as the price of recognition, and with the scarcely veiled threat of making peace with the North unless Europe should speedily act, the Confederate Department of State closed its four years of fruitless activity. Lee assumed command of all the Confederate forces on the ninth of February. His situation was one of unprecedented gloom. The day before, he had reported to Richmond that his troops, who had been in line of battle for two days at Hatcher's Run, exposed to the bitter winter weather, had been without meat for three days. If some change is not made, he said, and the commissary department reorganized, I apprehend dire results. You must not be surprised if calamity befalls us. Mr. Davis endorsed this discouraging dispatch with words of anger and command easy to write, this is too sad to be patiently considered. Criminal neglect or gross incapacity. Let supplies be had by purchase or borrowing. A prodigious effort was made, and the danger of starvation for the moment averted, but no permanent improvement resulted in the situation of affairs. The armies of the Union were closing in from every point of the compass. Grant was every day pushing his formidable left wing nearer the only roads by which Lee could escape. Thomas was threatening the Confederate communications from Tennessee, Sheridan was moving for the last time up the valley of the Shenandoah to abolish Early, while from the south the redoubtable columns of Sherman, the men who had taken Vicksburg, who had scaled the heights of Chattanooga, and, having marched through Georgia, had left Savannah, Loyal, and Charleston evacuated, were marching northward with the steady pace and irresistible progress of a tragic fate. It was the approach of this portent which affected the nerves of the Confederate leaders more than the familiar proximity of Grant. Beauregard, and afterwards Johnston, were ordered to destroy Sherman. Beauregard, after his kind, showed his government its duty in loud and valiant words. He advised Mr. Davis to send him at once heavy reinforcements, to give the enemy battle and crush him, then to concentrate all forces against Grant, march to Washington, and dictate a peace. A plan of limpid simplicity, which was not adopted. Johnston superseded the brilliant Louisianan the next day, and thereafter did what he could, with the scraps and remnants of an army allowed him to resist the irresistible. 
a singular and significant attempt at negotiations was made at this time by general lee he was now so strong in the confidence of the people of the south and the government at richmond was so rapidly becoming discredited that he could doubtless have obtained the popular support and compelled the assent of the executive to any measures he thought proper for the attainment of peace from this it was easy for him and for others to come to the wholly erroneous conclusion that general grant held a similar relation to the government and people of the united states general lee seized upon the pretext of a conversation reported to him by general longstreet as having been held with general e o c ord under an ordinary flag of truce for exchange of prisoners to address a letter to grant sanctioned by mr davis saying he had been informed that general ord had said that general grant would not decline an interview with a view to a satisfactory adjustment of the present unhappy difficulties by means of a military convention providing lee had authority to act he therefore proposed to meet general grant with the hope that upon an interchange of views it may be found practicable to submit the subjects of controversy between the belligerents to a convention of the kind mentioned in such event he said he was authorized to do whatever the result of the proposed interview may render necessary or advisable grant at once telephoned these overtures to washington stanton received his dispatch at the capitol where the president was according to his custom passing the last night of the session for the convenience of signing bills the secretary handed the telegram to mr lincoln who read it in silence he asked no advice or suggestion from anyone about him but taking a pen wrote with his usual slowness and precision a dispatch in stanton's name which he showed to seward and then handed to stanton to be signed dated and sent the language is that of an experienced ruler perfectly sure of himself and of his duty the president directs me to say that he wishes you to have no conference with general lee unless it be for capitulation of general lee's army or on some minor or purely military matter he instructs me to say that you are not to decide discuss or confer upon any political questions such questions the president holds in his own hands and will submit them to no military conferences or conventions meanwhile you are to press to the utmost your military advantages general grant on the receipt of this instruction wrote in answer to general lee that he had no authority to accede to his proposition such authority being vested in the president of the united states alone he further explained that general ord's language must have been misunderstood grant reported to washington what he had done adding that he would in no case exceed his authority or omit to press all advantages to the utmost of his ability this closed the last avenue of hope to the confederate authorities of any compromise by which the dread alternative of utter defeat or unconditional surrender might be avoided early in march general lee came to richmond and had a conference with mr davis on the measures to be adopted in the crisis which he saw was imminent the general-in-chief had not taken his advancement seriously he had not sympathized in the slight which it involved towards the civil government he had positively refused to assume the dictatorial powers with which the richmond congress had clearly intended to invest him he had ostentatiously thanked the president alone for a promotion which in reality came from the president's enemies and critics he continued to the end in accordance with the constitution of the confederate states to treat mr davis as the commander-in-chief of the forces he now laid before him the terrible facts by which the army was environed richmond and petersburg must be evacuated before many days a new seat for the confederate government a new base of defense for the armies must be taken up farther south and west there is a direct contradiction between mr davis and the friends of general lee as to the manner in which the former received this communication mr davis says he suggested an immediate withdrawal but that general lee said his horses were too weak for the roads in their present state and that he must wait till the ground became firmer but general long who gives general lee as his authority says that the president overruled the general that lee wanted then to withdraw his forces and take up a line behind the staunton river from which point he might have indefinitely protracted the war however this may be they were both agreed that sooner or later the richmond lines must be abandoned that the next move should be to danville that a junction was to be formed with johnston sherman was to be destroyed a swarm of recruits would come in after this victory and grant being caught away from his base was to be defeated and virginia delivered from the invader mr davis gravely set forward this program as his own in his book written sixteen years after the war but before he turned his back forever upon those lines he had so stoutly defended before he gave up to the nation the capital of the state for whose sake he had deserted his flag lee resolved to dash once more at the toils by which he was surrounded he placed half his army under the command of general john b gordon 
with orders to break through the Union lines at Fort Stedman and to take possession of the high ground behind them. The reticence in which General Lee enveloped himself in his last years has left his closest friends in doubt as to his real object in this apparently desperate enterprise. General Gordon, who takes to himself the greater share of responsibility for the plan, says, I decided that Fort Stedman could be taken by a night assault, and that it might be possible to throw into the breach thus made in Grant's lines a sufficient force to disorganize and destroy the left wing of his army before he could recover and concentrate his forces. It is certainly true that any fort can be taken, by day or night, if the assaulting party has men enough and is willing to pay the price. But to take a place which cannot be held is not what we expect from a wise and experienced general. Grant had, with singular prescience, looked for some such movement from Lee a month before. He had ordered Park, then in command of the Ninth Corps, to be ready to meet an assault on his center, and to let his commanders understand they were to lose no time in bringing all their resources to bear on the point of danger. With proper alacrity in this respect, he adds, I would have no objection to seeing the enemy get through. This is one of the most characteristic phrases we have met with in Grant's orders. It throws the strongest light both on his temperament and on the mastery of his business at which he had arrived. A month beforehand, he foresaw Gordon's attack, prepared for it, and welcomed the momentary success which attended it. Under such generalship an army's lines are a trap into which entrance is suicide. The assault was made with great spirit at half-past four on the morning of the 25th of March. Its initial success was due to a singular cause. The opposing lines at the point chosen were only 150 yards apart. The pickets were only 50 yards from each other. It was therefore a favorite point of departure for those Confederates who were tired of the war. Desertions had of late become very numerous, and had naturally been encouraged in every way. Orders had been issued allowing deserters to bring their arms with them. When Gordon's skirmishers came stealing through the darkness, they were at first mistaken for an unusually large batch of deserters, and they overpowered several picket posts without a shot being fired. The storming party at once followed, took the trenches with a rush, and in a few minutes had possession of the main line on the right of Stedman. Turning on the fort, they soon drove out the garrison or made them prisoners. It was the dark hour before dawn, and the defense could not distinguish friends from foes. For a little while, General Park, who acted with his usual vigor and intelligence, was unable to make headway against the invisible enemy who swarmed on both sides of the breach in the lines. General N. B. McLaughlin, who was posted to the left of Fort Stedman, at once got to work and recaptured an outlying battery with the bayonet, and then hurrying into the fort in ignorance of its capture was made prisoner. As soon as it was light, Park's troops advanced from every direction to mend the breach. R. B. Potter on the left, Wilcox on the right, and John F. Hartranft, who had been held in reserve, attacking directly from the high ground in the rear. The last two, between them, first made short work of the Confederate detachments that were moving on the City Point Road and Telegraph, and searching in vain for three forts in the rear of Stedman, which they had been ordered to take. There were no such forts, Humphreys says, where Gordon thought they were. The forts commanding Stedman were part of the main line. By half-past seven, Park had his task well in hand. He had repulsed the Confederate attack to the right and left of Fort Stedman, recaptured two of the detached batteries, forced the enemy with heavy losses back into the fort, and concentrated upon them a heavy artillery fire from three sides. The artillery under the direction of General J. C. Tidball worked with splendid energy and precision. Hartram's division carried Fort Stedman by assault, and Gordon withdrew to the Confederate lines what he was able to save of his attacking force. The crossfire of artillery was now so withering that few of the Confederates could get back, and none could come to their assistance. General Park captured 1,949 prisoners, including 71 officers and nine stands of colors. His own total loss was about 1,000. But this heavy loss was not the only damage the Confederates suffered. Humphreys and Wright, in command of the troops on the Union left, who were to be routed and dispersed according to General Lee's plan, on being informed of the racket in the center, correctly assuming that Park could take care of himself, instantly searched the lines in their front to see if they had been essentially weakened to support Gordon's attack. They found they had not, but in the process of gaining this information they captured the enemy's entrenched picket lines in front of them, which, in spite of repeated attempts to regain them, were firmly held, and gave inestimable advantage to the Union army in the struggle of the next week. The net results, therefore, to General Lee of the day's work were a bitter disappointment, a squandering of 4,000 of his best troops against half that number on the other side, 
and the loss of his entrenched picket line which brought such dangerous neighbors as wright and humphreys within arm's length of him for several weeks general grant's chief anxiety had been lest lee should abandon his lines at first he feared a concentration of lee and johnston against sherman but when the victorious army of the west had arrived at goldsboro and formed connection with Schofield, his anxiety on that score was at rest and there only remained a keen eagerness to make an end of the army of northern virginia i was afraid he says every morning that i would awake from my sleep to hear that lee had gone and that nothing was left but a picket line still just as lee though feeling every hour of waiting was fraught with danger was prevented from moving by the bad roads and the richmond complications grant although burning to attack was delayed by the same cause of bad roads and by another he did not wish to move until sheridan had completed the work assigned to him in the valley and joined either sherman or the army at petersburg but at last satisfied with sheridan's progress and with sherman's condition he resolved to wait no longer and on the twenty fourth of march at the very moment when gordon was making his arrangements for the next day's sortie grant issued his order for the great movement to the left which was to finish the war he intended to begin on the twenty ninth but lee's desperate dash of the twenty fifth appeared to the union commander to indicate an intention to secure a wider opening to the danville road to facilitate an immediate move of the confederates westward and he felt more than ever that not a moment was to be lost sheridan reached city point on the twenty sixth and sherman came up from north carolina for a brief visit the next day he said he would be ready to move on the tenth of april and laid before grant a plan for a cooperative campaign which was of course satisfactory as was usually everything that sherman proposed but which the swift rush of events soon rendered superfluous the president was also there and an interesting conversation took place between these famous brothers-in-arms and mr lincoln after which sherman went back to goldsboro and grant began pushing his army to the left with even more than his usual iron energy it was a great army it was the result of all the power and wisdom of the government all the devotion of the people all the intelligence and teachableness of the soldiers themselves, and all the ability and character which the experience of a mighty war had developed in the officers. Few nations have produced better corps commanders than Sheridan, Warren, Humphreys, Ord, Wright, and Park, taking their names as they come in the vast sweep of the Union lines from Dinwiddie Courthouse to the James in the last days of March. North of the James was Witzel, vigilant and capable. Between Grant and the Army of the Potomac was Meade, the incarnation of industry, zeal, and talent, and in command of all was Grant, then in his best days, the most extraordinary military temperament this country has ever seen. When unfriendly criticism has exhausted itself, the fact remains, not to be explained away by any reasoning, subtle or gross, that in this tremendous war he accomplished more with the means given him than any other two on either side. The means given him were enormous, the support of the government was intelligent and untiring, but others had received the same means and the same support, and he alone captured three armies. The popular instinct which hails him as our greatest general is correct, and the dilettante critics who write ingenuous arguments to prove that one or another of his subordinates or his adversaries was his superior will please for a time their diminishing coteries and then pass into silence without damaging his robust fame. The numbers of the respective armies in this last grapple may have been the occasion of endless controversy. We take the figures given by General Humphreys, not merely on account of his profound study of the subject and personal acquaintance with it, but because we consider him the most thoroughly candid and impartial man who has written the history of this army. The effective force of infantry of the Army of the Potomac was 69,000, a field artillery 6,000 with 243 guns. The effective force of the infantry of the Army of the James was 32,000, a field artillery 3,000, with 126 guns and 1,700 cavalry though General Ord took with him only about one-half his infantry. Sheridan's cavalrymen presented for duty 13,000. The grand total of all arms was 124,700. Lee's infantry numbered 46,000, his field artillery 5,000, his cavalry 6,000, in all 57,000. Grant's plan, as announced in his instructions of March 24th, was at first to dispatch Sheridan to reach and destroy the South Side and Danville Railroads, at the same time moving a heavy force to the left, primarily to ensure the success of Sheridan's raid, and then to turn Lee's position, 
but his purpose grew and developed every hour and before he had been a day away from his winter headquarters he had given up the comparatively narrow scheme with which he started and had adopted the far bolder and more comprehensive plan which he carried out to his immortal honor it is probable that to general sheridan belongs a part of the credit of this change of plan he often said in conversation with his friends that he was delighted after his victory over early at waynesboro to find such difficulties in crossing the james as prevented his going south to sherman and justified him neglecting his alternative orders to return to winchester in turning east and uniting with the army of the potomac he felt that the war was nearing its end and desired his cavalry to be in it at the death he thought it best that the eastern army which had thus far won scanty laurels when compared with the western should have the glory of this final victory and when he arrived at city point and found general grant's plans once more contemplated the possibility of sending his cavalry to sherman and bringing that commander after disposing of johnston to share in the destruction of lee sheridan urged the general-in-chief to finish the work immediately with the army of the potomac that had so richly merited the glory which would come of the fruition of their long years of blood and toil grant seems to have assured sheridan that his orders would not require him to go to sherman except in a remote contingency and that they had been prepared as a blind in case of failure both commanders were full of the spirit of victory on the evening of the twenty ninth of march sheridan's cavalry was at dinwiddie courthouse and the left of the moving force of infantry extended to the quaker road almost to lee's right flank on the white oak ridge grant's purpose had now taken complete shape in his mind from his tent on gravelly creek he wrote to sheridan telling him the position of all his corps and adding in simple words which will stir the blood of every reader for ages to come i now feel like ending the matter before going back he ordered sherman not to cut loose and go after the railroads but to push for the enemy's right rear we will act all together as one army here until it is seen what can be done with the enemy the next day sheridan advanced to five forks where he found a heavy force of the enemy lee justly alarmed by grant's movements had drawn all his available troops out of the trenches dispatched a sufficient force under fitzhugh lee to five forks to hold that important crossroads and had taken personal command of the rest of the white oak ridge a heavy storm of rain began the night of the twenty ninth continuing more than twenty-four hours and greatly impeding the march of the troops warren on the morning of the thirty-first worked his way towards the white oak road but before he reached it lee came out of his lines and attacked warren's advanced division Ares, with such impetus that it was driven back on the main line at gravelly run there gallantly supported by general miles of humphrey's corps who made a spirited attack on lee's left flank warren held his own and in the afternoon moved forward and drove the enemy into his works lee not satisfied with opposing sheridan at five forks with cavalry had on the thirtieth sent pickett there with some seven thousand infantry which with nearly an equal force of cavalry was too much for the union horse to handle sheridan was therefore on the thirty first forced back to dinwiddie courthouse here says grant sheridan displayed great generalship he fought with obstinate tenacity disputing every inch of ground deploying his cavalry on foot leaving only men enough with his horses to guard them he gave pickett and lee a hard day's work on the way to dinwiddie and at night reported his situation to grant in his usual tone of valorous confidence grant indeed was far more disturbed than sheridan he rained orders and suggestions all night upon meade warren and sheridan the purpose of which was to effect a concentration at daylight on that portion of the enemy in front of sheridan warren giving his troops who had been marching and fighting for three days a few hours needed rest came in on sheridan's right about dawn but pickett seeing that he was out of position did not wait to be caught between the two union columns he withdrew noiselessly during the night and resumed his strongly entrenched post at five forks grant in ignorance of this timely flight of pickett was greatly incensed at warren for not having done what is now seen to have been impossible to do since pickett was gone before the hour when grant wished warren to attack him the long smouldering dislike of warren which had been for months increasing in grant's mind now blazed out into active hostility and he sent an aide to camp to sheridan suggesting that warren be relieved from his command sheridan hurried up to five forks with his cavalry leaving warren to bring up the fifth corps filled as sheridan was all this day with the most intense martial ardor his judgment and control of his troops were never more powerful and comprehensive he pressed with his cavalry the retreating confederates until they came to five forks and then assigned to merritt 
the duty of demonstrating strongly on pickett's right while with the infantry of the fifth corps he was to strike the left flank which ran along the white oak road about three-quarters of a mile east from five forks and then made a return of a hundred yards to the north perpendicular to the road it was the old tactics of the valley repeated with the additional advantage in this case that if successful he would drive pickett westward and cut him off from lee to guard against any interruption from the east r s mackenzie had been sent to take possession of the white oak road some three miles east of the forks a task which he promptly performed and then came back to take his position on the right of the fifth corps the battle was fought almost as it was planned the only difference between conception and execution arose from the fact that it had not been practicable to ascertain the precise position of the enemy's left flank lest the attempt might put them on their guard airy's division was on the left crawford on the right griffin behind crawford and in this way they moved to the attack about four o'clock warren understanding that the enemy's lines reached farther down the road than was the case sent Ares, his smallest division in a direction which brought it against the angle and crawford and griffin were moving across the road and altogether past the left of the enemy into the woods when the heavy firing in front of Ares warned warren of his error and he immediately bestirred himself to rectify it sending his aides in every direction and finally riding off into the woods to bring crawford and griffin to the point where they were so greatly needed all this occupied considerable time and in the meanwhile the brunt of the battle fell upon Ares' division they were hardly strong enough for the work thus accidentally assigned to them and there might have been a serious check at that moment but for the providential presence of sheridan himself who with a fury and vehemence founded on the soundest judgment personally led the troops in their attack on the entrenchments those who saw him that day will tell the story to their latest breath how holding the colors in his hand with a face darkened with smoke and anger and with sharp exhortations that rang like pistol shots he gathered up the faltering battalions of Ares and swept like a spring gust over pickett's breastworks meanwhile warren was doing similar work on the right he had at last succeeded in giving his other two divisions the right direction and came in on the reverse of the enemy's lines at one moment finding some hesitation on the part of crawford's force warren riding forward says humphreys with the corps flag in his hand led his troops across the field his horse was shot dead in the final charge the dusk of evening came down on one of the most complete and momentous victories of the war pickett was absolutely routed every man was driven from the field except the killed and wounded and the prisoners who were gathered in to the number of some five thousand with a great quantity of guns and colors as the battle was ending sheridan sent an order to warren relieving him of his command and directing him to report to general grant for orders it does not come within the compass of this work to review all the circumstances which led general grant to entertain so rooted a dislike for warren and general sheridan who had but a slight acquaintance with him to adopt his chief's opinions in removing him from command they were perfectly justified honestly holding the opinion they held of him it was their duty to prevent the evils they thought might result from his retention in so important a trust but it is not improper here to say that a court of inquiry which general warren succeeded in obtaining after general grant had for twelve years denied it to him decided that the impressions under which grant and sheridan acted were erroneous and that warren did his whole duty at five forks grant never changed his opinion of him it is true he offered him another command the next day and soon afterwards he was given an important department to administer but the general-in-chief was always implacable towards him even in his memoirs in the midst of the compliments he pays to the memory of warren he shows his increasing prejudice in one phrase in his report of eighteen sixty five he said warren was relieved about the close of this battle in his memoirs he says the troops were then brought up and the assault successfully made after warren was relieved end of chapter eight chapter nine of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marianne abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter nine appomattox the battle of five forks ought to have ended the war lee's right had been shattered and routed his line as he had long predicted had been stretched westward until it broke there was no longer any hope of saving richmond or even of materially delaying its fall but general lee apparently thought that even the gain of a day was of value to the richmond government 
and what was left of the army of northern virginia was still so perfect in discipline and obedience that it answered with unabated spirit and courage every demand made upon it it is painful to record or to read the story of the hard fighting of the second of april every drop of blood spent on the lines of petersburg that day seems to have been shed in vain park and wright had been ordered on the thirtieth of march to examine the enemy's works in their respective fronts with a view to determine whether it was practicable to carry them by assault they had both reported favorably after the great victory of five forks grant whose anxiety for sheridan seems excessive thought that lee would reinforce against him heavily when in fact lee had already sent to his right all the troops that could be spared and sheridan had routed them to relieve sheridan and to take advantage of any weakness in lee's extended front grant now ordered an assault all along the lines the answers came in with electric swiftness and confidence wright said he would make the fur fly ord promised to go into the confederate lines like a hot knife into butter the ground however in front of ord was so difficult that grant gave him no positive orders to assault but on the contrary enjoined upon him great vigilance and caution similar instructions were given to humphreys miles of his corps was ordered westward on the white oak road to help sheridan and wright and park were directed to attack at four o'clock on the morning of the second grant's principal anxiety was lest lee should get away from petersburg and overwhelm sheridan on the white oak road lee was thinking of nothing of the kind the terrible blow his right had received seemed to have stunned him he waited with a fortitude not far from despair for the attack which the morning was sure to bring making what hasty preparations were in his power for the coming storm it came with the first glimmer of dawn wright who had carefully studied the ground in his front from the safe point of vantage he had gained the day of gordon's ill-fated sortie had selected the open space in front of forts fisher and walsh as the weak point in the confederate harness not that it was really weak except in comparison with the almost impregnable works to right and left the enemy's front was intersected by marshy rivulets a heavy abatis had to be cut away under musketry fire from the parapets and a rain of artillery from the batteries it was a quarter to five before there was light enough to guide the storming columns but at that instant they swarmed forward rushing over the confederate pickets with too much momentum to be delayed a minute and gaining the main works made them their own after a brief but murderous conflict in fifteen minutes wright lost eleven hundred men they wasted not an instant after this immense success some pushed on in the ardor of the assault across the boyton road as far as the south side railroad the gallant confederate general a p hill rode unawares upon a squad of these skirmishers and refusing to surrender lost his life at their hands but the main body of the troops wisely improved their victory a portion of them worked resolutely to the right meeting strong resistance from the confederates under wilcox the larger part reformed with the celerity that comes from discipline and experience and moved down the reverse of the captured lines to hatcher's run where about seven o'clock having swept everything before them and made large captures of men and guns they met their comrades of the twenty fourth corps whom they joined facing about and marching over ground cleared of the enemy till the left closed in on the appomattox river park also assaulted at the earliest light meeting with a success on the outer line equally brilliant and important capturing four hundred yards of entrenchments with many guns colors and prisoners but there was in front of him an interior line heavily fortified and here the enemy under general gordon not only made a stand but resumed the offensive and assaulted several times during the day without success the lines which park had seized in the morning and hastily reversed on the left humphreys displayed his usual intelligent energy as soon as he heard of the success of wright and park on his right he attacked with hayes division the confederate redoubt at crow's house capturing the works the guns and most of the garrison while on his left mott's division drove the enemy out of their works at burgess's mill humphreys wanted to concentrate his whole corps against the scattered enemy by the Clybourne road but general meade countermanded the movement mott and hayes were ordered towards petersburg and miles who had been holding the white oak road for sheridan was therefore left alone to deal with hess's division which had hastily entrenched itself near sunderland station and here a sharp fight took place miles twice repulsed stuck obstinately to his task and about three o'clock whipped and dislodged the enemy making large captures and driving him off towards the appomattox and amelia courthouse two forts gregg and whitworth 
on the main line of the confederate entrenchments west of petersburg made a stout resistance to the national troops the former was a very strong work surrounded by a deep and wide wet ditch flanked by fire to the right and left it was an ugly thing to handle but robert s foster's and j w turner's divisions of gibbon's corps assaulted with unflinching valor meeting a desperate resistance every advantage except that of numbers was on the side of its brave defenders and they put twice their own numbers hors de combat before they surrendered gibbon reports a loss of seven hundred and fourteen killed and wounded fifty-five confederate dead were found in the work after Gregg had fallen turner's men made short work of fort whitworth and the confederates from the appomattox to the weldon road fell slowly back to their inner line of works near petersburg now garrisoned by longstreet's troops who had come in from the north side of the james the attack of wright though it must have been anticipated came upon general lee with the stunning effect of lightning before the advance of the national army had been reported to lee or a p hill they saw squads of men in blue scattered about the boyton road and it was in riding forward to ascertain what the strange apparition meant that general hill lost his life general lee in full uniform with his dress sword which he seldom wore but which he had put on that morning in honor of the momentous day he saw coming being determined with that chivalrous spirit of his to receive adversity splendidly watched from the lawn in front of his headquarters the formidable advance of the national troops before whom his weakened lines were breaking into spray and then mounting his iron-gray charger slowly rode back to his inner line there his ragged troops received him with shouts and cheers which showed there was plenty of fight left in them and there he spent the day in making preparations for the evacuation which was now the only resort left him he sent a dispatch to richmond carrying in brief and simple words the message of despair to the confederate authorities i see no prospect of doing more than holding our position here till night i am not certain i can do that he succinctly stated the disaster that had befallen him announced his purpose of concentrating on the danville road and advised that all preparations be made for leaving richmond that night some confederate writers expressed surprise that general grant did not attack and destroy lee's army on the afternoon of the second of april but this is a view after the fact easy to express wright's and humphrey's troops on the union left had been on foot for eighteen hours they had fought an important battle marched and countermarched many miles and were now confronted by longstreet's fresh corps behind formidable works led by the best of lee's generals while the attitude of the force under gordon on the south side of the town was such as to require the close attention of park grant anticipating an early retirement of lee from his citadel wisely resolved to avoid the waste and bloodshed of an immediate assault on the inner lines at petersburg he ordered sheridan to get upon lee's line of retreat sent humphreys to strengthen him then directing a general bombardment for five o'clock the next morning and an assault at six he gave himself and his soldiers a little of the rest they had so richly earned and which they so seriously needed as a restorative after the labors past and a preparation for the labors to come he had telegraphed during the day to president lincoln who was at city point the great day's news as it developed hour by hour he was particularly happy at the large captures how many prisoners was always the first question as an aide-de-camp came galloping in with news of success prisoners he regarded as so much net gain he was weary of slaughter he wanted the war ended with the least bloodshed possible it was with the greatest delight that he was able to telegraph on this sunday afternoon the whole captures since the army started out gunning will not amount to less than twelve thousand men and probably fifty pieces of artillery general lee after the first shock of the breaking of his lines soon recovered his usual sang-froid and bent all his energies to saving his army and leading it out of its untenable position on the james to a point from which he could effect a junction with johnston in north carolina the place selected for this purpose was burksville at the crossing of the south side and danville roads fifty miles from richmond whence a short distance would bring him to danville where the desired junction might be made even in this ruin of the confederacy when the organized revolt which he had sustained so long with the bayonets of his soldiers was crashing about his ears he was able still to cradle himself in the illusion that it was only a campaign that had failed that he might withdraw his troops form a junction with johnston and continue the war indefinitely in another field whatever we may think of his judgment it is impossible not to admire the coolness of a general who in the midst of an irremediable disaster such as encompassed lee on the afternoon of the second of april could write such a letter as he wrote to jefferson davis under date of three o'clock 
he began it by a quiet and calm discussion of the question of negro recruitment promised to give his attention to the business of finding suitable officers for the black regiments hoped the appeal mr davis had made to the governors would have a good effect and altogether wrote as if years of struggle and effort were before him and his chief he then went on to narrate the story of the day's catastrophe and to give his plans for the future he closed by apologizing for writing such a hurried letter to your excellency on the ground that he was in the presence of the enemy endeavoring to resist his advance at nightfall all his preparations were completed he mounted his horse and riding out of the town dismounted at the mouth of the road leading to amelia courthouse the first point of rendezvous where he had directed supplies to be sent and standing beside his horse the bridle reins in his hand he watched his troops file noiselessly by in the darkness at three o'clock the town which had been so long and so stoutly defended was abandoned only a thin line of skirmishers was left in front of park and before daybreak he pierced the line in several places gathering in the few pickets that were left the town was formally surrendered to colonel ralph eli at half past four anticipating the capitulation which some one else offered to general wright a few minutes later meade reported the news to grant and received the order to march his army immediately upon the appomattox by the river road grant divining the intentions of lee dispatched an officer to sheridan directing him to push with all speed to the danville road with humphreys and griffin and all the cavalry thus the flight and the pursuit began almost at the same moment the swift-footed army of northern virginia was now racing for its life and grant inspired with more than his habitual tenacity and energy and thoroughly aroused to the tremendous task of ending the war at once not only pressed his enemy in the rear but hung upon his flank and strained every nerve to get in his front it is characteristic of him that he did not even allow himself the pleasure of entering richmond which deserted by those who had so often promised to protect it and wrapped in flames lighted by the reckless hands of confederate officials surrendered to weitzel early on the morning of the third all that day lee pushed forward towards amelia courthouse he seemed in higher spirits than usual as one who has long been dreading bankruptcy feels a great load taken from his mind when his assignment is made so the virginian chief when he drew out from the ruin and conflagration in which the confederate dream of independent power was passing away and marched with his men into the vernal fields and woods of his native state was filled with a new sense of encouragement and cheer i have got my army safe out of its breastworks he said and in order to follow me the enemy must abandon his lines and can derive no further benefit from his railroads or james river but he was now dealing with the man who in mississippi had boldly swung loose from his base of supplies in an enemy's country in face of an army equal to his own and had won a victory a day without a wagon train there was little fighting the first day except among the cavalry custer attacked the confederates at nemonazine church and later in the day merritt's cavalry had a sharp contest with fitzhugh lee at deep creek on the fourth sheridan who was aware of lee's intention to concentrate at amelia courthouse brought his cavalry with great speed to jetersville about eight miles southwest of the courthouse where lee's army was resting sheridan entrenched and sent tidings of his own and the enemy's position to grant and on the afternoon of the next day the second and sixth corps came up a terrible disappointment awaited general lee on his arrival at amelia courthouse he had ordered he says supplies to be forwarded there but when his half-starved troops arrived on the fourth of april they found that no food had been sent to meet them and nearly twenty-four hours were lost in collecting subsistence for men and horses this delay was fatal and could not be retrieved the whole pursuing force was south and stretching out to the west of him when he started on the night of the fifth of april to make one more effort to reach a place of temporary safety burkeville the junction of the lynchburg and danville roads was in grant's possession the way to danville was barred and the supply of provisions from the south cut off lee was compelled to change his route to the west and he now started for lynchburg which he was destined never to reach it had been meade's intention to attack lee at amelia courthouse on the morning of the sixth of april but before he reached that place he discovered that lee's westward march had already begun and that the confederates were well beyond the union left meade quickly faced his army about and started in pursuit a running fight ensued for fourteen miles the enemy with remarkable quickness and dexterity halting and partly entrenching themselves from time to time and the national forces driving them out of every position moving so swiftly that lines of battle followed closely on the skirmish line at several points the cavalry on this and the preceding day harassed the moving left flank of the confederates 
and worked havoc on the trains, on one occasion causing a grievous loss to history by burning Lee's headquarters baggage with all its wealth of returns and reports. Sheridan and Meade pressed so closely at last that Ewell's corps was brought to bay at Sailor's Creek, a rivulet running northward into the Appomattox. Here an important battle, or rather a series of battles, took place, with fatal results to Lee's fast-vanishing army. The Fifth Corps held the extreme right and was not engaged. Humphreys, coming to where the roads divided, took the right fork and drove Gordon down towards the mouth of the creek. A sharp battle was fought about dark, which resulted in the total defeat of the Confederates, Humphreys capturing 1,700 prisoners, 13 flags, 4 guns, and a large part of the main trains, Gordon making his escape in the night to High Bridge with what was left of his command. Wright, on the left-hand road, had also a keen fight, and won a most valuable victory. With Wheaton's and Seymour's divisions, he attacked Ewell's corps, in position on the banks of the creek, enveloping him with the utmost swiftness and vehemence. Sheridan, whose cavalry had intercepted the Confederates, ordered Crook and Merritt to attack on the left, which was done with such vigor, Davies's horsemen riding over the enemy's breastworks at a single rush, that, smitten in front and flank, unable either to stand or to get away, Ewell's whole force was captured on the field. The day's loss was deadly to Lee, not less than eight thousand in all, among them such famous generals as Ewell, Kershaw, G. W. Custis Lee, M. D. Corse, and others were prisoners. In the meantime Ord, under Sheridan's orders, had moved rapidly along the Lynchburg Road to Rice's Station, where he found Longstreet's corps entrenched, and night came on before he could get into position to attack. General Theodore Reed, Ord's chief of staff, had gone still further forward with eighty horsemen and five hundred infantry to burn High Bridge, if possible. In the attempt to execute this intention he fell in, in the neighborhood of Farmville, with two divisions of Confederate cavalry under Rosser and T. T. Munford. One of the most gallant and pathetic battles of the war took place. General Reed, Colonel Francis Washbourne, and all the cavalry officers with Reed were killed, and the rest captured. The Confederate loss was also heavy. Reed's generous self-sacrifice halted the Confederate army for several hours. Longstreet lost the day at Rice's Station, waiting for Anderson, Ewell, and Gordon to unite with him. They were engaged in a fruitless attempt to save their trains, which resulted, as we have seen, in the almost total loss of the trains, in the capture of Ewell's entire force, and in the routing and shattering of the other commands. The day's work was of incalculable value to the national arms. Sheridan's unerring eye appreciated the full importance of it. His hasty report ended with the words, If the thing is pressed, I think that Lee will surrender. Grant sent the dispatch to President Lincoln, who instantly replied, Let the thing be pressed. In fact, after nightfall on the 6th, Lee's army could only flutter like a wounded bird with one wing shattered. There was no longer any possibility of escape. Yet General Lee found it hard to relinquish the illusions of years, and his valiant heart still dreamed of evading the gathering toils and forming somewhere a junction with Johnston, and indefinitely prolonging the war. As soon as night had come down on the disastrous field of Sailor's Creek, he again took up his weary march westward. Longstreet marched for Farmville, crossed to the north bank of the Appomattox, and on the 7th moved out on the road which ran through Appomattox Courthouse to Lynchburg. His famishing troops had found provisions at Farmville, and with this refreshment, marched with such celerity that Grant and Sheridan, with all the energy they could breathe into their subordinates, could not head them off or bring them to decisive battle that day. Nevertheless, the advance of the Union Army hung close upon the heels of the Confederates. The rear corps under Gordon had burned the railroad bridge near Farmville behind them, but General Barlow, sending his men forward at Double Quick, saved the wagon bridge, and the Second Corps crossed over without delay and continued the chase, Humphreys taking the northern road and sending Barlow by the railroad bed along the river. Barlow overtook Gordon's rear, working great destruction among his trains. Humphreys came up with the main body shortly after noon, and pressing them closely held them till evening, expecting Barlow to join him, and Wright and Crook to cross the river and attack from the south, a movement which the swollen water and the destruction of the bridge prevented. General Irvin Gregg's brigade had indeed succeeded in getting over, but was attacked by an overwhelming force of Confederate cavalry, three divisions, Gregg being captured and his brigade driven back. This trivial success in the midst of unspeakable disaster delighted General Lee. He said to his son, W. H. F. Lee, Keep your command together, and in good spirits, General. Do not let it think of surrender. I will get you out of this. 
but his inveterate optimism was not shared by his subordinates a number of his principal officers selecting general william n pendleton as their spokesman made known to him on the seventh their belief that further resistance was useless and advised surrender general lee replied i trust it has not come to that we have yet too many bold men to think of laying down our arms besides he feared that if he made the first overture for capitulation grant would regard it as a confession of weakness and demand unconditional surrender but general grant did not wish to drive a gallant antagonist to such extremes on this same day seeing how desperate was lee's condition and anxious to have an end of the now useless strife he sent him this courteous and generous summons the result of the last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the army of northern virginia in this struggle i feel that it is so and regard it as my duty to shift from myself the responsibility of any further effusion of blood by asking of you the surrender of that portion of the confederate states army known as the army of northern virginia this letter was sent at night through humphrey's lines to lee who at once answered though not entertaining the opinion you express on the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the army of northern virginia i reciprocate your desire to avoid useless effusion of blood and therefore before considering your proposition ask the terms you will offer on condition of its surrender the forlorn remnant of the confederate army stole away in the night on the desperate chance of finding food at appomattox and a way of escape to lynchburg and at daybreak the hot pursuit was resumed by the second and sixth corps all this day the flight and chase continued through a portion of virginia never as yet wasted by the passage of hostile armies the air was sweet and pure scented by opening buds and the breath of spring the early peach trees were in flower the sylvan bypaths were slightly shaded by the pale green foliage of leafing trees through these quiet solitudes the diminishing army of lee plodded on in the apathetic obedience which is all there is left to brave men when hope is gone and behind them came the victorious legions of grant inspired to the forgetfulness of pain and fatigue by the stimulus of a prodigious success sheridan on the extreme left by unheard of exertions at last accomplished the important task of placing himself squarely on lee's line of retreat his advance under george a custer captured about sunset on the evening of the eighth appomattox station with four trains of provisions then attacked the rebel force advancing from farmville and drove it toward the courthouse taking twenty-five guns and many prisoners a reconnaissance revealed the startling fact that lee's whole army was coming up the road though he had nothing but cavalry sheridan with undaunted courage resolved to hold the inestimable advantage he had gained sending a request to grant to hurry up the required infantry support saying that if gibbon and griffin could get to him that night they might perhaps finish the job in the morning he added with singular prescience referring to the negotiations which had been opened i do not think lee means to surrender until compelled to do so this was strictly true when grant received lee's first letter he replied on the morning of the eighth saying peace being my great desire there is but one condition i would insist upon namely that the men and officers surrendered shall be disqualified from taking up arms against the government of the united states until properly exchanged i will meet you or will designate officers to meet any officers you may name for the same purpose at any point agreeable to you for the purpose of arranging definitely the terms upon which the surrender of the army of northern virginia will be received but in the course of the day a last hope seemed to have come to lee that he might yet reach appomattox in safety and thence make his way to lynchburg a hope utterly fallacious for stoneman was now on the railroad near lynchburg he therefore while giving orders to his subordinates to press with the utmost energy westward answered general grant's letter in a tone more ingenuous than candid reserving while negotiations were going on the chance of breaking away he said i received at a late hour your note of to-day in mine of yesterday i did not intend to propose the surrender of the army of northern virginia but to ask the terms of your proposition to be frank i do not think the emergency has arisen to call for the surrender of this army but as the restoration of peace should be the sole object of all i desired to know whether your proposals would lead to that end i cannot therefore meet you with a view to surrender the army of northern virginia but as far as your proposal may affect the confederate states forces under my command and tend to the restoration of peace i should be pleased to meet with you at ten a m tomorrow on the old stage road to richmond between the picket lines of the two armies grant was not to be entrapped into a futile negotiation for the restoration of peace he doubtless had in view the president's peremptory instructions of the third of march forbidding him to engage in any political discussion or conference 
or to entertain any proposition except for the surrender of armies. He therefore answered General Lee on the morning of the ninth of April with perfect courtesy, but with unmistakable frankness, saying, I have no authority to treat on the subject of peace. The meeting proposed for 10 a.m. today could lead to no good. I will state, however, General, that I am equally anxious for peace with yourself, and the whole North entertains the same feelings. The terms upon which peace can be had are well understood. By the South laying down their arms, they will hasten that most desirable event, save thousands of human lives and hundreds of millions of property not yet destroyed. Seriously hoping that all our difficulties may be settled without the loss of another life, I subscribe myself, etc. He dispatched this letter to Lee, and then set off to the left, where Sheridan was barring Lee's last avenue of escape. It appears from General Grant's report, made three days after the surrender, that he had no intention on the night of the 8th of giving up the fight. He ordered Fitz Lee, supported by Gordon, in the morning, to drive the enemy from his front, wheel to the left, and cover the passage of the trains, while Longstreet should close up and hold the position. He expected to find only cavalry on the ground, and thought even his remnant of infantry could break through Sheridan's horse, while he himself was amusing Grant with platonic discussions in the rear. But he received, on arriving at the rendezvous he had suggested, not only Grant's stern refusal to enter into a political negotiation, but other intelligence which was to him the trump of doom. Ord and Griffin had made an almost incredible march of about thirty miles during the preceding day and night, and had come up at daylight to the post assigned them in support of Sheridan. And when Fitzhugh Lee and Gordon made their advance in the morning, and the National Cavalry fell slowly back, in obedience to their orders, there suddenly appeared before the amazed Confederates a formidable force of infantry filling the road, covering the adjacent hills and valley, and barring, as with an adamantine wall, the further progress of the Army of the Revolt. The marching of the Confederate Army was over for ever. The appalling tidings were instantly carried to Lee. He at once sent orders to cease hostilities, and, suddenly brought to a sense of his real situation, sent a note to Grant asking for an interview in accordance with the offer contained in Grant's letter of the 8th for the surrender of his army. Grant had created the emergency calling for such action. As Sheridan was about to charge on the huddled mass of astonished horse and foot in front of him, a flag of truce was displayed, and the war was at an end. The Army of Northern Virginia was already captured. "'I've got em, like that,' cried Sheridan, doubling up his fist, fearful of some ruse or evasion in the white flag. The Army of the Potomac on the north and east, Sheridan and Ord on the south and west, completely encircled the demoralized and crumbled Army of Lee. There was not another day's fighting in them. That morning at three o'clock Gordon had sent word to Lee that he had fought his corps to a frazzle and could do nothing more unless heavily supported by Longstreet. Lee and his army were prisoners of war before he and Grant met at Appomattox. The meeting took place at the house of Wilmer McLean, on the edge of the village. Lee met Grant at the threshold and ushered him into a small and barely furnished parlor, where were soon assembled the leading officers of the National Army. General Lee was accompanied only by his secretary, Colonel Charles Marshall. A short conversation led up to a request from Lee for the terms on which the surrender of his army would be received. Grant briefly stated the terms which would be accorded. Lee acceded to them, and Grant wrote the following letter. In accordance with the subsistence of my letter to you of the 8th instant, I propose to receive the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia on the following terms, to wit, rolls of all the officers and men to be made in duplicate, one copy to be given to an officer designated by me, the other to be retained by such officer or officers as you may designate the officers to give their individual paroles not to take up arms against the government of the united states until properly exchanged and each company or regimental commander sign a like parole for the men of their commands the arms artillery and public property to be parked and stacked and turned over to the officer appointed by me to receive them this will not embrace the side arms of the officers nor their private horses or baggage this done each officer and man will be allowed to return to their homes not to be disturbed by united states authority so long as they observe their parole and the laws in force where they may reside. General Grant says in his memoirs that up to the moment when he put pen to paper he had not thought of a word that he should write. The terms he had verbally proposed, and which Lee had accepted, were soon put in writing, and there he might have stopped. But as he wrote, a feeling of sympathy for his gallant antagonist gradually came over him, and he added the extremely liberal terms with which his letter closed. The sight of Lee's sword, an especially fine one, suggested the paragraph allowing the officers to retain their sidearms. 
and he ended with a phrase which he had evidently not thought of, and for which he had no authority, which practically pardoned and amnestied every man in Lee's army, a thing he had refused to consider the day before, and which had been expressly forbidden him in President Lincoln's order on the 3rd of March. Yet so great was the joy over the crowning victory, so deep was the gratitude of the government and the people to Grant and his heroic army, that his terms were accepted as he wrote them, and his exercise of the executive prerogative of pardon entirely overlooked. It must be noticed here, however, as a few days later it led the greatest of Grant's generals into a serious error. Lee must have read the memorandum of terms with as much surprise as gratification. He said the permission for officers to retain their sidearms would have a happy effect. He then suggested and gained another important concession, that those of the cavalry and artillery who owned their own horses should be allowed to take them home to put in their crops. Lee wrote a brief reply accepting the terms. He then remarked that his army was in a starving condition, and asked Grant to provide them with subsistence and forage, to which he at once assented, and asked for how many men the rations would be wanted. Lee answered, about 25,000, and orders were at once given to issue them. The number of surrendered turned out to be even larger than this. The paroles signed amounted to 28,231. If we add to this the captures at Five Forks, Petersburg, and Sailor's Creek, the thousands who deserted the failing cause at every by-road leading to their homes, and filled every wood and thicket between Richmond and Lynchburg, we can see how considerable an army Lee commanded when Grant started out gunning. Yet every Confederate writer, speaker, and singer who refers to the surrendered says, and will say for ever, that Lee surrendered only 7,000 muskets. With these brief and simple formalities, one of the most momentous transactions of modern times was concluded. The news soon transpired, and the Union gunners prepared to fire a national salute. But Grant would not permit it. He forbade any rejoicing over a falling enemy, who he hoped would hereafter be an enemy no longer. The next day he rode to the Confederate lines to make a visit of farewell to General Lee. Sitting on horseback between the lines, the two heroes of the war held a friendly conversation. Lee considered the war at an end, slavery dead, and the national authority restored. Johnston must now surrender, the sooner the better. Grant urged him to make a public appeal to hasten the return of peace, but Lee, true to his ideas of subordination to a government which had ceased to exist, said he could not do this without consulting the Confederate president. They parted with courteous good wishes, and Grant, without pausing to look at the city he had taken or the enormous system of works which had so long held him at bay, intent only upon reaping the peaceful results of his colossal victory and putting an end to the waste and the burden of war, hurried away to Washington to do what he could for this practical and beneficent purpose. He had done an inestimable service to the Republic. He had won immortal honor for himself— but neither then nor at any subsequent period of his life was there any sign in his words or his bearing of the least touch of vainglory. The day after Appomattox he was as simple, modest, and unassuming a citizen as he was the day before Sumter. End of chapter 9